everybody. Thank you for coming to this special broadcast. We're going to be talking about mental health, um, particularly the challenges of working um, through the, the quarantine, re-entering life, talking to children about the virus, and a lot more. This is a particularly challenging time for the entire nation in terms of um, our mental health. So we have joining us Dr. Joshua Gordon, director of the National Institute of Mental Health, which is one of the preeminent um, uh, research organizations uh, for the United States in mental health, or the preeminent one really. Uh, Dr. Chloe Carmichael, a licensed psychologist from Long Island University. She's also a certified yoga instructor and an expert particularly in mindfulness-based stress reduction. And Dr. Sophia Nori, a third-year psychiatry resident at the Yale Department of Psychiatry and co-founder of the Yale Women's House Staff Organization and the Women's Mental Health Conference at Yale. Thank you, everybody. Um, to get started, I guess we'll just um, have each of you sort of tell me a little bit about what you personally have found to be what the, the things that you're hearing from other people is the, the most difficult thing to deal with over this time. Um, and we'll just go with Dr. Uh, Gordon first. Hi, well, uh, first, Tara, thanks for having me uh, here with you all. It's very exciting to be able to communicate about mental health aspects of the COVID pandemic to a, a large audience and engaged audience. The uh, news from the front lines is challenging to say the least. Uh, we don't have a lot of hard data yet, but the research researchers that are studying the mental health impacts of the pandemic are quite concerned. There's a number of surveys out there which have demonstrated pretty sizable increases in the rates at which people are noticing symptoms of things like depression, anxiety, grief, worry, uh, and other mental health symptoms. Knowing what we know from previous epidemics and disasters, we can expect that to continue as long as a threat of COVID continues and uh, for as long as the impact of the COVID pandemic is felt both economically and in terms of the mitigation measures and indeed as we return to work. So we're concerned that there will be increased demand for mental health services. And we're starting to see that as I'm sure my colleagues will discuss more directly. We're starting to see that in terms of what patients and clients are saying as they go to seek help from their providers. Dr. Carmichael, what are you hearing from clients and, and seeing on the front lines? Um, I will be completely honest in saying that I have my own therapist that I talk to and she's told me it's, you know, she's hearing a lot of the same things over and over and over again. We're, we're all in this big sinking boat, it feels like sometimes. Yeah, well, the thing is, I think that this pandemic has really touched a lot of related topics in people's minds. So, you know, you might have issues from the past about, you know, fears of survival or social isolation or even rejection sensitivity has been getting pinged for people because intellectually they know why everyone's keeping their distance, but it still does just feel strange. You know, human beings are, we're kind of meant to be around other people. Uh, so there's, there's just been a little bit of a cumulative effect for different people. Um, but the good news is, is that it has been a time where there's opportunities for reflection and there's opportunities to get to know yourself better. And, you know, I, I have all kinds of great coping strategies and activities that I've been sharing with people and I'm excited to share them with your listeners today as well. Dr. Nori, um, what are you hearing from people? And I'm, I'm especially interested in something that Dr. Carmichael mentioned. The isolation is one of the key features of this pandemic that we're experiencing. It's not just fear and uncertainty, it's fear and uncertainty and not really feeling like you can share that in person with people. Have you been hearing about people, about effects of the isolation that they're experiencing? Yes, I have, Tara. And I, um, I actually, I completely agree with what Dr. Carmichael was saying to you. I was, I was going to say that I think the biggest issue I've been seeing is just loneliness and the social isolation that people have been experiencing. So in my work, I was, um, I was also redeployed as an internal medicine doctor on the, on the, um, in, in the hospital for, um, to treat COVID um, patients. And then I was also working in the emergency room. Um, treating psychiatric patients that were coming in as well. And my, my main um, site is at Connecticut 
Connecticut Mental Health Center, which is a safety net hospital that treats underserved, un underinsured, and um, undocumented folks. And um, you know, especially after after having to up switch to remote work um, and not being able to see your provider, um, you know, a lot of that 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 physical distancing is really making people lonely. Um, and we've been trying to come up with ways to have to, to help people still feel socially close, even if you have to be physically distant. Um, so I think a lot of treatment has been moving online. Um, and at least personally for me with my patients um, who are pretty vulnerable as well, um, I've been trying to call them more often um, than, I, than I used to see them just to make sure that they know that somebody cares. Actually, I'd, what, let's follow that line there. I'd like to follow up with you on what you're saying there about how you're trying to find ways to help people feel close even when they're not physically close. Can you discuss some of those strategies? And especially for those, given your population, yeah. there's a lot of people watching this who are in those particularly vulnerable populations and they're gonna be returning to work soon or they're still having to work. Um, so I'd like to hear more about what you're doing to help them sort of figure out ways to have that community even when they're not right in the middle of a room full of people. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we've been trying to do at, at our center is um, um, redeploying all of the, the groups that used to happen in person online. So we've been we've been trying to have phone based groups like online um, um, zoom based groups as well. Um, um, calling people more frequently just to let just to check in even if it's just for five minutes um, twice a week or something like that just to make sure that they know somebody's checking in on them. Um, you know, and there's I think there's also ways to be physically distant and still still spend time with people. So one of my um, mentors, Dr. Jordan, she likes to call it physical distancing instead of social distancing. That, you know, the idea is we don't want people to be socially apart from each other, um, but, um, but they just have to maintain a certain amount of physical distance. So we've been trying to actually encourage patients to, you know, ob observe safety measures like wearing a mask, staying six feet away, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, go to a park, sit on a bench and have your friend six feet away from you where, and still talk to them you know so just trying to be um flexible and creative in like how you still are able to live your life and spend time with people um dr carmichael you mentioned that you've been talking to your clients about a lot of different strategies for dealing with this stress could you talk about things that people can be doing whether it's exercises or exercise itself or you know what they can do to sort of try and uh manage the, the stress and anxiety that they're experiencing Yes, I was really hoping you'd ask me that question. I'm so glad you did. Um, so, you know, there's so many uh, things that a person can do, but the first thing I just want to mention is that we do have something in our brains called mirror neurons. And those mirror neurons only fire and get active when they're looking at another human face. And what they do is they take on the expression or the emotion that that human face is showing. And so that's basically the neural underpinnings of empathy and of connection. And so I would encourage people, just like Sophia was saying, that when you have the chance, let's get together on Zoom. Let's, you know, voice to voice is okay, but if possible, let's get together on Zoom so that we can see each other's lovely faces. Um, it's also important to remember, um, I work with a lot of what's known as high functioning people, and they're often really afraid to ask for support. They're like, I don't want to be a burden to anyone. Um, and they're often, it's, it's good for them to know that when you ask someone for support, if you tell someone, you know what, I'm just feeling lonely. I've got the COVID, you know, quarantine blues. Can we talk? They're afraid that that's going to tax people. But what they don't know is that psychology studies show that asking for support actually is a compliment. It tells the other person that you value them and you see them as a resource. So unless you're someone who's asking for support 24 seven, please know that if you ask someone for support, you're not gonna be a drain on them. You're actually going to be, uh, generally speaking, you know, paying them a compliment. Another thing that's important to think about is our self-talk. I mentioned earlier that we can have this, you know, rejection sensitivity or, you know, feeling alone type of, you know, monologue going on in our mind. And it can be helpful to give ourselves uh, true statements, like for example, we're being distant because we care about each other. To just repeat that type of a statement to yourself because it stops you, you know, from spinning out into a monologue about, you know, feeling 
isolated or, or feeling rejected by people. Um, another thing that can be helpful for people um, is to always know when their next video date is with somebody. So if you do have a close friend or family member and you want to stay in touch by video, uh, this is actually kind of a trick I learned from some military families that they use this when they're deployed is it helps to decrease the uncertainty of wondering when will we talk again? Will it be because I just get so lonely that I finally initiate another video date or like when and how will it happen? And so having it just as a regular thing that's on the books can be really helpful for people. One final tip as well is um, yoga techniques like yin yoga or restorative yoga often involves skin to skin contact with yourself. Because when we are isolated, we can get something called skin hunger. We just need to be touched. Um, and so on uh, uh, my website, drcloy.com slash COVID, I also have some links to places where people can learn about yin yoga and other ways that they can get that feeling of, of human touch, even if they're just alone. Thank you for that. That's fascinating. I'm going to definitely check that out myself. Um, Dr. Gordon, I know a lot of your past research dealt with brain plasticity and the underpinnings of anxiety and depression. Can you talk a bit about some of the symptoms people might be experiencing that they don't realize are symptoms of anxiety and depression? For example, I've noticed that it's harder for me to read books. Books were always a good escape for me, and I would read my books to get away from the world, but it's harder for me to focus and concentrate on reading my books, and I assume that's probably part of everything that's going on, but I might not realize that. What are things that people might be experiencing that they're not consciously recognizing, oh, uh, that's because, uh, that's not because I'm going crazy, it's not because I'm stupid, it's not because I'm losing my mind, it's because I'm living in the world that we're living in right now. Can you talk a bit about some of that so people can have a bit more awareness of, of what this is doing to their brains, I guess? Sure, so in addition to feeling sad or feeling anxious, depression and anxiety manifest in many ways in your body. First and foremost, as many people do know already, depression and anxiety can lead to difficulty sleeping or feeling tired all the time, even if you're getting enough sleep. Other bodily sensations include pain that might be worse than it is normally. Lower back pain or stomach pain can be a sign of something going wrong with your body, but can also be a sign of depression or anxiety. Um, and then uh, it's important to realize, like you suggest, that there are a lot of things that can go wrong with your brain when you're depressed. You can have trouble concentrating. You can have a loss of appetite. You can have uh, changes in your eating habits, lower motivation to go out and do things. And we've all been talking about the importance of maintaining social ties despite the need to physically distance. Your motivation for seeking out those social ties, which can be so helpful, that motivation can be decreased as well. So it's important when you see these things, as you suggest, oh, I'm having trouble reading, I'm, I'm having trouble sleeping, I'm, I can't follow this plot line in this complicated uh, TV series, you know, things that you normally would be able to do that you recognize that that might be a sign that you can use more support and so that you can reach out, as others have suggested already, uh, that you can reach out to get that support. Could you, some of those things people may not recognize in themselves, but they might notice it in other people. What are ways that people can sort of check in on others without making them feel, you know, you don't, no one likes to feel coddled, right? No, no one likes to feel like they're, they're being um, checked in on, but we all probably need a little bit of checking in on. What can people do to sort of check on their friends, notice things in their family members and, and broach, hey, you know what, maybe you should talk to a therapist or hey, why don't we go take a walk together? Well, the walking together and the making the phone calls, making appointments for video conferencing, happy hours and things like that. These are all great ideas that we should be doing with all our friends, but especially for the ones that you might be concerned about. I know that we all have older relatives who might be living alone and might be really isolating even more than the rest of us right now. Take the extra effort to call them once a week or even once a day. Um, teach them how to use uh, FaceTime if they don't already and, and use that so that you can see the face-to-face -face. You can get those mirror neurons active like Chloe suggested. There's lots of different things that one can do just to be social. But really what you're asking is what can you do when you're genuinely worried about someone without 
sort of making them feel like, you know, there's something wrong with them. And I like to suggest some, starting with something simple, like, hey, how you doing? And then when they say fine, you say, no, really, how, how are you doing? I know I'm having a hard time with this COVID stuff. I really miss seeing you. I wonder how you're really doing. And then the other thing is you shouldn't be afraid to ask directly about symptoms like, are you having trouble sleeping? Are you feeling down all the time? You know, I, are, have you been able to get through that book? I know that you were trying to read to get some sense of how they're doing more objectively and to offer help if you think they need it. The vast majority of people who are in a situation where they could use some support will appreciate that, especially if it's done in the context of an ongoing caring relationship. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nori, I have a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old, and I'm sure many people watching this have small kids. And um, both of them have had their challenges, lots of challenges, you know, being stuck at home. I've noticed that they also have wanted to spend more time with me at nighttime. Like, they want to crawl into my bed more. And my older son is suddenly afraid of ghosts again when he wasn't afraid of ghosts at all for a long time. Um, you know, there's these slight changes that I think I'm seeing. Can you talk a bit about how anxiety might manifest in children and what parents can do both to address that and just to talk to them in general about the virus? What are, what are some actual words they can use to talk to children that will help children understand such an uncertain, scary thing without being dishonest and without scaring them further? Yeah, thanks. I think that's a great question. Um, and um, I, I, I'm not a child psychiatrist myself, um, but I have treated um, teenagers and young people and also in the Yale community um, who are, are also noticing, like even though they're not small children, they're also noticing too that there's certain things that they, they're now afraid of that they weren't before, like even driving, things that, that, make, um, that give you a loss of control. And so I think it's really understandable that your kids might also in some ways um, find things scary that they didn't before, which can sometimes be called regressing just a bit. Um, and you know, it's, I think it's, it's important, like with all difficult subjects, when you try to, um, to share with your kids to be honest, but to give them um, the information that they can um, take in a bite sized way. And, and um, that is still that still helps them feel a sense of control in some way. So, you know, I think um, educating your kids about um, the fact that there is um, a, a, an illness that's, that's, that's in the community right now, but there are things that we can do to try to um, protect ourselves from it, if possible, and that um, they should try to focus on things that they can do, like washing their hands, um, things like that, um, to try to give them actionable um, um, items that they can work on without thinking of this as like a, a, like a, a three-headed monster that, that they can't get away from um, because I think you know kids are feeling more anxiety and also just everyone in general is um, because of that lack of control. Uh, Dr. Gordon did you have anything to add to that? I, I don't know if you have much experience with kids either and um, yeah. or any suggestions on how to help kids understand why they can't see their friends for example? Yeah so the first and foremost thing that I would say in addition to really uh, Dr. Nori's wonderful suggestions is that it's important to listen to your kids and find out what they're really worried about. Um, you and I might be worried about our jobs or the economy or returning to work or not returning to work or how our children are doing, but the kids might be worried about missing their best friend's birthday um, and giving them a chance to voice their fears, their concerns, what's going on with them can be helpful. And so always I say, listen first. Uh, in regards to the, the, uh, the specific question um, about uh, now I can't remember what the specific question was. Oh, Say, kids not being able to see their friends? Yeah, about kids not being able to see their friends. First of all, they can, right? Just from a socially distant way. So figuring out ways that they can do a Zoom birthday party or go to the park, but stay on, you know, different um, jungle gyms and uh, wear masks, et cetera. That can be really, really helpful. Can kick soccer balls to each other right? Kids can even throw a ball if they're going to wash their hands afterwards. So there are things that kids can do with each other. So the first and foremost, see if there are ways to get them to see their friends. And then the other thing, as, uh, as Dr. Nori suggested, is that kids do understand that this is an, a 
really unusual situation and helping them get a sense of how long it might last. And that though we don't have all the answers, yes, you will be able to play with your friend again someday um, and figure out ways to in, help them enjoy what they can enjoy in the meantime, I think can be very helpful. It's the uncertainty, I think, that bothers us all the most. And kids not knowing even as much as we do about the situation have that much more uncertainty. I know two things that I've done with my kids. One thing is that they love playing Minecraft and other games socially at the same time. Well, they'll be on the phone for two hours. I probably shouldn't say how long we're letting them <laughs> for five hours or, <laughs> but you know, playing games with the kids and they, and they get that experience. Um, and they also, I created a, a Facebook group called Zoom Parties for Kids with just a couple friends of mine so that our kids could get together and you know, share each other's pets. Uh, we had a Pokemon party where we talked about our favorite Pokemon and, and things like that. We're all worried about the adverse effects of social media and screen time on kids, but no one talks about the fact that these different technologies can also have a potential benefit. And we're seeing some of the benefits as part of this pandemic. Yes, your kids are spending a lot of time in front of the screen, but a lot of that time is social. And that's really positive to be able to maintain social ties through this physical distancing. And Dr. Nori, I love the fact that your mentor uses that term instead of social distancing. I wish we all did. So uh, we're getting close to the end, but there's a really important topic we haven't addressed yet. We've been talking a lot about staying home and being isolated, but of course, a lot of people are not staying home because they can't. Um, they, they've either been working throughout the pandemic or they're going to be going to work soon. Or perhaps, uh, like many of my colleagues, where I am, they're having to go to work before they really should. You know, the, the, they don't have a lot of confidence either in their place of business or in their leadership to think that it is safe enough to go to work. Dr. Nori, can you talk about what people can do to manage that uncertainty and, and still feel safe and what you're seeing people experience in the need to either continue going to work or now starting to go back out into the world and, and you know, when, when the threat's still there, but it's, again, that uncertainty of how much it's still there. Yeah, that's really tough, Tara. And I, I, I personally experienced it too, because I also still go to work um, and I go into the hospital and I have a whole disinfection routine after I come home. Um, and uh, my partner also goes to work. Um, uh, so I, I think one thing I've also very much noticed um, from leadership at, at different centers within my own institution too, is that it really matters like whether or not leaders are being transparent about what's going on and, and if they're um, involving um, worker voices and trying to figure out the best ways to be safe going, um, going to work. So I think one piece of advice I would have too is um, even if your leadership isn't even at, isn't soliciting to this um, from you is, is to advocate for yourself. And if you don't feel safe, to speak up. And I think that can really, that also really helps um, in terms of um, feeling like a loss of control. I think a lot of people also can't do that, right? Um, and, and that's also part of this, this the, um, the anxiety about going to work. Um, and um, that is a really difficult problem in our nation as a whole. And I think um, is really putting, making all of us feel stressed. Um, you know, in other countries, in like Singapore and Taiwan, they've come up with very robust public health systems to make sure that people can still go to work and be safe. And I, I find it really unfortunate that we're in this bind right now where people are, are essential workers, but um, they might be risking their health. I don't actually have a great answer for that. Um, I, I don't know if any of us do, but I would love to hear if Dr. Gordon or Dr. Carmichael have better suggestions than me <laughs> on this. It is a tough bind, I think, all around. Dr. Gordon, do you have anything to add to that? I, I agree. It's a tremendous tough bind, and it affects uh, the underserved. It affects minority communities. It affects impoverished communities. It affects rural communities much more than it does, uh, you know, middle-class America uh, in the suburbs and, and even in the cities. It, it does so because they don't have options. They don't have the ability to speak up. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tremendously challenging situation. Uh, the one piece of advice that I would add to what Dr. Nori suggested would be that uh, um, maintaining some degree of self-control as much as possible can be really helpful. Get a mask and wear the mask. No, it's not 100%. And no, it shouldn't make us all feel invincible, but it can help restore a little bit of I'm doing what I can. And even if your coworkers aren't wearing masks, you, you are, and you're doing something to help. Um, you can also suggest to your coworkers that they 
wear masks or maybe carry on a, a few extra masks and give it to them. They're pretty cheap to make now. If you it's just simple cloth masks and you can, you can make friends by handing them out. So I, I use that as one example, but really anything one can do, whether it's speaking out, whether it's using PPE, whether it's, you know, trying to avoid uh, being within six feet of a coworker, the, the extent to which we can gain some piece of control back and feel like, okay, I'm doing my part. I'm doing what I, can that can really help us something i'll add to that just because i've been working on a, a story myself about this um uh, face shields can also be really helpful in restoring a sense of control because they provide you a bit more protection than the mask the mask is designed mostly to protect others from you and offers you a small amount of protection but a face shield actually offers you a lot of protection um, and they're easy to order online or get it at you know a home depot or even make yourself by putting plastic around a visor hat so that's just to mention to other people if they want to consider that so tara i wanted to also respond to what you had said earlier about you know maybe sometimes just finding like even something as simple as reading a book can be a little bit more challenging than before and I do just want to normalize that um, because we have so much running in the background that we're trying to kind of process around this. And so what we want to avoid is getting anxiety about anxiety. So if it's a little bit harder to process things just because there's so much going on right now, and then we start getting really anxious or nervous about the fact that things are taking a little bit longer, you know, then we can almost start to snowball a little bit. So I do think that this is a great time to practice more self-care and give yourself a little latitude if you find that you sometimes do just want to let your mind idle a little bit. Again, with high-functioning people, sometimes letting their mind idle isn't exactly like their, their most comfortable space, but that's actually when our brain does a lot of processing. So if you want to just let yourself chill a little bit or do some journaling. I also think it's a great time to do mind maps if anyone is familiar with those. Like if you were to just like write quarantine in the middle of a piece of paper and then draw some lines out and jot down what are some of the first words that come to mind for many people, like it'll be their parents and then drawing some connector lines. Like, well, what do you think of when you think of your parents? And that allows you to take inventory of what are all the things that are getting pinged for you mentally and then that helps to put some context around why something like reading a book might you know, take a little longer. And it also empowers you to know what are the areas that you might wanna to talk to someone and, and get some support around these issues. Thank you. I'm going to try and mind map when we get off this. Um, I'm, glad, I'm so sorry I didn't see you come back because I especially wanted to ask you about, the, about talking to children because you mentioned that you have so many high functioning um, uh, clients. I'm sure a lot of them feel frustrated with a sense of lack of control and inability to answer the kids' questions. I mean, it's one thing when your kid asks, why is the sky blue and you can't answer the question. It's another thing when your kid asks, you know, when can I see my friend again and you can't answer the question. How do you advise your clients to talk to their kids and deal with their own um, feeling helplessness and trying to help their kids, I guess, you know, that, that, that wanting to be the parent that you feel like you can't be? Yeah, quarantine does actually offer parents some unique challenges, and I'm a parent as well, and it also offers us some unique opportunities. So what we want to do, I think, is actually really to lead by example. So that means that it's okay to say, I don't know, or I'm kind of struggling with that too. Um, and then it's almost less important that you give your child the exact answers of how to deal with COVID, and more important, that you model for them how to cope with a challenging situation where people don't have all of the answers. Trying times like this are actually when families can oftentimes become closer. When I was an undergraduate, I helped with some research about homeless families, and it was actually shown that homeless families experienced greater levels of closeness than um, you know, oftentimes families with a lot of financial resources. And the research team speculated that that might be because of the higher level of interdependence that these families need to have. So again, it's just an opportunity really to model for your children that it's okay if you don't have all the answers. And another thing that you can do to help children to remind themselves that they're actually not helpless is to look at online volunteering opportunities. So learning how to help other people. Again, on my website, drchloe.com slash COVID, I also have a list of online volunteer opportunity links. 
And that can be a great thing for kids as well as adults to do. And it does give you something new to talk about around the dinner table. Great. Well, I'll give you each a chance to say any final words. I'm sure there's, I, I have tons of other questions, but I know we can't go on forever. Um, uh, so anything that you really wanted to convey that I haven't asked about or anything you really want to emphasize that we've already discussed? And I'm just going to start back um, with Dr. Nori. Yeah, I, I just want to um, bring it back to the, to the uh, title of the session, which I think is like when and how to seek help. Um, and I just want to say, and I think all of us would echo the same sentiment that there's really no wrong way to seek help. Like if you're feeling distressed, you know, the world is a distressing place right now too, you know, and we are all in this together. And the, the best thing that you can do is just reach out to somebody and let somebody know how you're feeling. Um, um, because people do care about you and, uh, and we're, we all want to help. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. Dr. Gordon. Well, first of all, that was a great suggestion, uh, recognizing the need, uh, not the need, but the ability to reach out for help uh, at any time to anyone. Um, I want to add something that we haven't talked much about, which is the notion that, uh, although it was touched on a little bit uh, most recently by, by Chloe, but the, the notion that we are living through an extraordinary time and that creates all kinds of stresses and that makes life very challenging and raises the risk for mental illnesses and uh, lots of other problems. But it also creates an opportunity for, for resilience. It's important to remember that resilience is not something we're born with. It's something that we learn through experience. And I think for many of us, uh, while this time, this pandemic time will be very, very challenging and will affect us in very deep ways, it will also give us an opportunity to grow. Uh, and making the most of that opportunity is something that we can all do, regardless of how uh, we're feeling in the moment. I was thinking about that as Dr. Carmichael was talking, that this is a great chance to, to model for my kids resilience and, and trudging through and building character, which is, you know, kind of a cliche, but it's true. I mean, it really, you know, resilience is what will get you through life eventually. Um, Dr. Carmichael, any uh, final words? Sure. I mean, I love all the thoughts I've heard so far. You know, just to add to them, I would, you know, raise the idea of behavioral activation in psychology, which is where when we start doing certain behaviors, then they can, you know, start to trigger certain mindsets. And so if we've been going through the behavioral routines of a socially avoidant, you know, person that stays home and, and doesn't talk to people, then we can start to take that on and think that that's who we are. Um, and so I would encourage you to, you know, consider just behavioral activation in the other way, which is where you just, you know, kind of take the plunge and start reaching out to some people and talking to them, remembering that um, asking for support, talking about the fact that you're having a little bit of a hard time and could use their support or asking them for help with something is oftentimes actually a way that people become closer and 100% that this is the time that we can increase our resilience uh, with ourselves and with other people. That's a great note to end on. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody, and for all of your great advice. I'm going to be running, running off and doing some of this myself. So I really appreciate um, you giving us this time and, and sharing your expertise with us. Um, I wish everybody out there good luck with dealing with all of this. And remember that we really are all in it together, even when it doesn't feel like we're all in it together. We are, and we'll get through it. There's, there's light there at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes it feels really far off like a pinprick, but it is there. And so we just have to kind of keep trudging forward and, and help each other. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you.